Hi, Duncan. Welcome Hi, here. Pedro. Yeah. How are you doing? I'm doing fine, thank you. Enjoying the early autumn, late summer here in uh, Denmark, not far from you. Yeah, I can say that it's already winter. <laughs> I got the winter feeling in the, the chilly winter feeling in the morning. Like six uh, degrees already. Leaves. So I got hold of you a couple of days ago just to talk about what's happening in OSARC, open source and AEC, because we finally got a platform up where people can come and look at some of the projects we want to highlight and donate money and that's oh that's kind of a big thing that's that's what you want okay so you just want to to say that you have a, 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 an organization that people can donate money to. okay okay that sounds good like a good business plan <laughs> that's that's the start of something big yeah before we go there please tell us a bit who you are so i'm duncan i'm from new zealand trained as an architect in new zealand and um, i live in, in Denmark with my family with a uh, Danish education, which is called a constructing architect and project manager education um, and work for uh, one of the large international uh, architecture firms here. And I'm also one of the community organizers in OSARC, open source and architecture, and, and part of the little steering committee that we've got trying to bring, you know, a, an appropriate amount of structure and decision making and, and the sorts of things that organizations need as they grow. That's kind of my, my role here, I think. That sounds good. And what is OSR? So OSR is, so the, the term was coined, I think about two years ago when Dion Molt, who you've talked to many times, was talking to Dimitri, who does cool videos on YouTube with Blender and Tissue add-in for a fantastic architecture concept. They bought the domain OSR, which is just open source architecture. So that's open source software and free software for architecture, engineers, and construction designers and facility managers. And so the whole software ecosystem that you need for working with the built environment, we're trying to organize it and build it up as free software sometimes. Yeah. And then there's the whole thing of the terms, right? It's free software and open source, but we'll, we'll jump over that and stick with open source. That's the term people know. And what exactly would you like to share with me today about OSR? So what we've been working on for a while, and it's, it's interesting how long some discussions take, we've been trying to work out what's a good way of becoming not just a group of people who talk and coordinate, uh, which is really important, but it kind of hits a brick wall when you want to go out and talk to the world and, and organize funding and stuff. So we found the uh, Open Collective platform, which is a, a fascinating project, which is a whole web platform to help organizations uh, register as American 501c6, which is a not-for-profit business. And that means organizations in America can donate money to us and all the other open collective projects and get it and what's it called? Not pay tax on it. I don't remember what uh, it's called in English. So they can make tax free contributions because it's a 501c6. Okay, to make a deduction from the taxes. That's right. It's a deductible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and and but... we've been approached every now and then by some American companies asking if we could do that. And, and Dion has had the same situation with Thomas and IFC Open Shell, where companies will come along and of course they'd rather not pay tax on their donations. So now OSARC is, is also ready to receive donations and we're looking at different ways of organizing that. But why is OSARC important? Why should people even bother to give any money for this? What is the mission of this organization? Well, OSARC in its most basic form, OSARC is about is about creating a built environment and now I'm just reading it, right? Creating a built environment with free software, increased transparency, and a more ethical approach. So what we're doing is we're looking at, we're looking at the whole AEC industry and saying that there's a problem here. There's a problem with too few players. There's a problem here. And there's a problem with too few players and the few players that there are, they don't always behave uh, in the best interests of the industry. Okay, they need to earn money, but some of them earn money in unreasonable ways. We can all guess who I'm talking about. And there's, and there's all of these problems of people putting their heart and soul into a project and then discovering that they can't really get that data out and do what they want to do with it. Like they, they don't really own it because the data structure is not transparent. The software is expensive. The versions keep changing and it's really hard for, for all of that work to really be something that you own. And it's really hard to investigate what is my software doing with all of this effort that I've put in? Because you can't investigate what the code is doing either because it's all a, a black box, right? So that's one aspect of putting the power back in the hands of, of the users who are putting their heart and soul into these projects. So that's one part of it. Another part of it is the whole question of innovation. And we can see in a lot of industries, the growth of 
free software, open source software has meant that that disparate projects can learn from each other and grow off of each other's work in a way that that really supports innovation instead of the way that most copyright is enforced, which is about if one company finds something innovative, nobody else is allowed to do it for 70 years or whatever, right? That they put as many impediments in the way as possible. That's another problem that that OSR is trying to fight. And we're fighting it by promoting software that is just developed in a different paradigm, a paradigm that says, um, I need to fix this problem. You need to fix this problem. I've done some code over here. You've done some code over there. Let's make a project together. So if you were to restate this very short and clearer, anyone can understand. In a way, what you try to do is like to make product like, let's say, a very popular software like Revit for free and open uh, and somebody like uh, in a way that ev everyone can use it and code it for uh, according to their needs. Is this what I understand from this or is this wrong? Being able to edit things is great, right? Yeah. Throw me the question again and I'll try a, a concise version. Yeah. If we will uh, try to give a more concrete example and much simpler, uh, shorter version of this, uh, which would be what exactly so I would guess, be? I think the short version of what OSR is trying to do is for all of the love and energy people put into their project, we say, you own it. You need the tools to do what you want with your data. We want to help you together with developers make the tools on your terms so that the power is back in, in your hands. You can collaborate with people. People can innovate together. We can learn from each other. So instead of these closed silos, we can all be one big happy family actually lifting each other's value instead of competing on software we should be competing on great ideas that's true there is a catch here though to be honest i do not know how many professionals are care about the data most of the people i think they are thinking to be product they are thinking to deliver some drawings or a model for a project right so i'm not sure how many are thinking that way but i can tell you something everyone is thinking at the bugs and at the difficulties they have when they export to a IFC from Revit. Everyone thinks about the price they pay yearly for a tool like Revit, Archicad or any other one. So there are definitely different reasons for different people. And those ones, I think the majority of people don't care what they tool use. I don't think that. They care to deliver and how much money that costs them to do it, right? And there is also something else. A tool that it has a lower entry point for anyone to come in, learn it without any upfront investment and then use it and make money working as an engineer or architect or a freelancer or whatever, right? Then that's very powerful, right? Because now it's not so easy. Like if you want to dedicate, let's say you want to become a Revit expert and you don't have it at work, you just want to upgrade to find a better job, right? Who can afford to buy a Revit license? Sorry for talking so much about the Revit, but I want to make this very clear. It's a good example in this case because a lot of people are using Revit, right? It's not very easy without going and paying for an expensive course where they provide you, but still, it's just a course. You won't be able to let work, let's say, half a year or a year on projects, on your own small gigs to learn it more in depth and so on, right? You either need it through work because you will not afford to pay for it and learn it, right? To to learn how to use it, to become an expert with it. Or I'm sure a lot of people are you doing, they are using a cracked version, like a illegal version. And that not a lot of people are comfortable to do that, of course. So I think there are uh, these different reasons as well. But la like for people that are really thinking about what you said about owning their data and so on, that's very compelling. But I don't think that is the majority of participants in our industry, to be honest. I don't know what you think about this. Well, there's, of course, there's a few things you mentioned there. But going back to some of what you're saying at, at the beginning about owning your data, or maybe just about what are people's motivation? Like, why would you be interested in this? It is, it's really hard because we've got a day job. We've talked about this. I spend most of my time supporting Revit based workflow. That's the reality of my work. But I can't say that I admire the progress that's been made with Revit in the 10 years that I've been using it. I can't say that it's a, a joy to use for making renderings and showing people the, the model. I can't say that it's a quick snappy program. And I can't say that I know what's happening in the background when things go wrong with it. And I definitely can't say that it's being innovated. Um, I've I've been on some of the courses, I've looked at their generative design, I've used some of the Dynamo, but as, as soon as you look at what else is out there, there's lots of other great stuff happening out there. And Blender, of course, is kind of the poster child for that. But there are also things, if you're a Revit user 
and you work in the family editor um, and you find the family editor a bit hard and a bit unpredictable. It's always been like that, by the way. <laughs> That's nothing new. It's amazing they haven't done anything about it. And you're always having problems with constraints. If you go over to FreeCAD, for example, and look at the, the power that you have in FreeCAD to manage your constraints and to make sure that your that your object is geometrically going to be valid as you change the parameters in it. It's a completely different, I mean, it's not a different paradigm, it's very much the same paradigm, but the whole, the power that you have in doing that sort of family type object in, uh, in FreeCAD is, is amazing. I, I guess my point is when you're a big company with a big software platform and the users let you tie up their data in your closed platform, then they can't get away from you. Mm. So the pressure to innovate just isn't there. Yeah, then you have the right. reason why there is not so compelling and the urge reasons to push and to improve the export to IFC experience. Yeah, so, I mean, I understand that a, a lot of users, they'll I'll look at many of the tools we're working with and the projects that we kind of promote. And they're like, oh, well, maybe I'll play with it in the weekend, but I can't use it at work. Maybe that's right. And and maybe there are some workflows that are ready for day-to-day -day work for a BIM manager. Um, I mean, the power of Blender BIM as an extension to Blender, which is all which is using IFC Open Shell as its as its uh, powerful machine in the background. That's starting to get to a stage where it can do, well, it can do the sort of inquiries into what's going on in your in your IFC file that start paralleling some of the commercial software. Um, mm. So there are there are niches where we're being able to manage your data much more personally and being able to program the tool yourself starts to give you more value rather than less. So you've got a tool that uh, you're encouraged to use free and some of the functions that it has give more value. But I understand end users, it's not always for them and that's okay if we're just talking about getting your day-to-day -day work done because what what we really need or where i think so where i think things are heading is the people who are in the industry because they love the industry and because they love innovation and because they're looking five years ahead ten years ahead they can see the writing on the wall they know that workflows based on how the old dinosaurs like to dance is just not it's not going to do it in the really long term so whether it's for their own business or whether it's because they as a person can see this is the way things are going and they care about they care about us being in charge of our own information and being in charge of the projects that we do. I mean, it's it's a mystery to me that big architecture firms will do fantastic projects and then leave it in a file rotting in a folder somewhere that they that they can't even open anymore because nobody's nobody's made sure the data is structured in a way that they can inquire again. In, in 10 years, 20 years time. You don't have a budget in a project to do that. Like it's, it's simple and nobody's asking projects, for that, right? But some projects, like if, if you would, if we go back to the paper days, right? If you're doing the night, if you're doing good drawings, you use acid free paper because you want those drawings to still be there later. If you're doing beautiful models that you want to be able to share and learn from later, maybe we need to be thinking about whether the way that that data is organized and nowadays it's usually going to be an IFC file. Mm -hmm. Whether that IFC file is actually going to be something we can pull out in 10 years, 20 years time when we're doing a book about the great projects our company made to show the yeah. workflow. I definitely see the value in that, mm -hmm. but it's just not a priority for today at least. Yeah, it's not a priority for, for a lot of end users. And, and as you say, and I would say that it's partly because people don't care about their data. And especially now where... People are, are willing to put their faith in companies like Zoom and put their faith in companies like Google. Google's not the worst, right? But Meta and Facebook and, and some of these companies that again and again show us they can't be trusted and again and again say they're doing one thing with our data and then do something else. People mm. just don't seem to care anymore and, and they don't seem to expect better of companies. Um, yeah. And there are, because some the company, not all companies are the same. Some companies have always focused more on allowing you to use a different tool if you want to switch workflows. I think ArchiCAD is one of the examples, right? For, for a long time, they've understood that their tool was not the strongest tool for doing MEP systems and steel systems. So they focused a lot on making sure that, that ArchiCAD was good at interacting via the IFC format with other software. I see that as a commitment to the idea that you should use the best tool for the job. That sounds good. I think it should be nice to talk a bit about how people, and just mention that not only people cannot contribute through donations, they can also involve through coding and other stuff, right? 
to become a part of the community and so on. So uh, where should people read more about OSR and uh, maybe about other ways uh, they can e get themselves involved? I think I'll just show you the, the front page of our website because that's a good way to, to go through. So this is the front page of our website, osarc.org, um, where you can read articles and everything. So, I mean, the best way to learn about um, a lot of the projects and stuff that's through the wiki there's tons of stuff there there's a very large uh, software directory here software directory with more than 100 maybe 200 by now on project a lot of those projects you can go in and read more about them and then they're parts of categories where you can read all sorts of stuff so here's a whole lot of stuff about blender and we've got the community you can go and chat in our forum i saw there's about 300 posts a month happening on the forum so that's really lively and the new thing and there's a chat we talk in the chat sometimes and subscribe to our newsletter so you know what's happening and the new thing of course is this is now that you can you can actually donate with money but great question and and good to remind me that that although at the moment my focus is on this business of being able to donate because that's the new thing we just want people to be able to to join in and to learn about what we're doing to learn what the tools are, to learn the, the value of understanding your tool and um, be part of the community to innovate and, and new ideas and new tools to, to the AC sector yeah. in whatever way works best for you. Yeah, that makes sense. That, that's really nice, actually. Yeah, to just even there are a lot of people who are just lurkers, you know, just uh, just being there, but they see they are aware about what's happening and sometimes you never know how they might contribute right and not only that there are a lot of people learning a lot of things like you find a lot of tutorials maybe you hear about new tools that are free and open source that you could try if you have the time right to see as an uh, alternative for uh, the tool you are using so yeah why not give it a chance there's lots of people ready to answer all sorts of strange questions that i don't understand on the forum about complicated things about yeah but uh, like myself i learned about uh, a lot about ifc for example I like everyone is very helpful if you ask and uh, mainly there are people that have a lot of uh, uh, competence they are very very good at, at nerdy stuff that normal people can get help with and yeah the community is growing also quite nice i've seen many new faces lately and the chat is much more active lately than before so yeah. that's very very nice yeah it's a very nice place to interact with each other yeah it's a it is a great forum it's really bringing together the type of community feeling and, and supporting each other that comes from the open source software movement into the AEC software sector. It's a lot of fun. Yes, exactly. Thank you very much, Duncan.